Now, I've got a very, very brief two-sentence thing here which does not do Andrew Tridgell justice. It says, Andrew Tridgell has been developing free and open source software for nearly 20 years. He holds a PhD in computer science from the ANU and is active developer in a number of well-known free software projects, including the Samba project. And that's like saying, you know, Picasso painted some pictures. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, I came across the Samba project, I must confess to my shame, when I had a phone call one day at the Defence Department headquarters where I was working in Canberra, and somebody said, look, we've done this software, Samba. Could we have some money to make it better and you can use it? And I said, well, if it's not a commercial product in a box, then you're not going to get any money. And that was Samba, I think. Um, what I should have said was, send us an empty box. <laughs> and we'll send you a whole lot of money, and when you've got it written, that'll be fine. Um, but anyway, Samba, a widely used piece of software, not only on uh, Linux computers, but others as well, um, and a number of other projects that uh, Mr. Tridgell's been involved in, uh, including um, for commercial companies on a large scale as well. But I'll let him um, give a presentation and show us some toys. Yes, uh, thanks very much, Tom. Um, <laughs> so, I do have a couple of toys, but they're actually better just passed around. People can kind of have a look at them and play with them. Maybe I should pass them around. These are a couple of little Linux boxes. It's just, it's great to see free software being ubiquitous. Um, this is a little GPS. You know, you often see them in cars, standard one that Avis has in Europe. That's based on Linux. Um, the Tom Tom is all based on Linux. This is an e-book reader, marvellous little device, all based on Linux, eminently hackable. Um, and uh, by default comes with nasty DRM stuff, but the DRM is avoidable, luckily. More about DRM later. If anyone wants to, here you go, what's up, mate? If you just want to have a look, you're welcome to turn them on, play, turn the pages, whatever. But nothing to do with my talk, because what I wanted to talk about today is how to the society, Australian society, can take advantage of free and open source software. So this is really direct, directly at what we might submit upstream to the 2020 summit. And uh, thinking about this a little bit, um, I wanted to first of all reflect on why we have the issues that we do in the IT industry. And I think fundamentally it comes down to the flexibility of computers. Computers are incredibly flexible things. I think it's true to say that the IT industry is simultaneously the, the industry most capable of being open and the industry most capable of being locked down and closed. So we are poles apart. Now, one example of that was given by Jeff earlier. He talked about the GPL, the GNU General Public License, uh, as being a marvellous hack on copyright. That was you, Jeff, wasn't it? Yep. Marvellous hack on copyright and how it used the copyright um, act against itself and it was an absolutely brilliant piece of work by Richard Stallman. And I would like to add something at the other end of the spectrum there. There is another absolutely ingenious hack on the copyright system. That's DRM. But it's an ingenious hack for evil. It's also using the copyright system against itself right, in an evil way. It is just as ingenious as the GPL, but it can be misused in such a terrible manner. And so we have the industry has these poles apart, um, this dichotomy of able to be open, we're able to present the results of our, we, we can, in a, in a second, take, take this presentation and make it available to millions of people around the world. That's incredible. But at the same time, I could lock it down so that no one else can touch it. And that's horrible. Okay, so moving on. Um, the next thing I think we need to realise is that uh, if given the opportunity, many, perhaps most corporations, will choose proprietary solutions because proprietary solutions enable monopolies and monopolies lead to easy profits. So the dream of the company is to get a monopoly, right? So this is where public policy is so important to guide, the, uh, to guide companies down a path that maximises benefit to society rather than letting them take their natural inclinations of maximising benefit to themselves. So third thing, direction of society, we have to, the benefits of open computing and sharing of information to society as a whole are completely obvious. They're completely obvious to everyone in this room. I am sure they're completely obvious to most people um, in the IT industry. 
The challenge is to find ways to encourage the individual elements of society to make that open choice when it may not be in their individual best interest to make that choice. And it's a tragedy of the commons. Okay, so um, next thing I want to take as a, as a sort of a basic premise is that free software is here to stay. Free and open source software is not a passing fad. If I was giving a talk like this a decade ago, I would have been talking about, you know, the future, I, I hope it will contain FOSS. Well, the future has arrived, we contain FOSS, FOSS is heavily established. When you go and buy a gadget these days, there's a very good chance it's based on free software internally. Very, very good chance. Um, Linux basically is a dominant player, um, if not the dominant player, in the embedded market, which is pretty incredible given the number of computing devices there are in the, in the embedded market. And this has happened uh, without much fanfare. Uh, it just happens. You go and you buy a device, the consumer doesn't care, but underneath the companies are benefiting from the investments of others. So TomTom Tom there that make that little GPS that's being played with down there benefited from all the work done by many developers here in this room. They've used your code, Rusty. They've used my code. They've used you know, Jeff's code. Lots of people's code they've used in that device and they've benefited from that. And that is a huge benefit to society because it reduces the cost of producing that new technology. Right? It makes society better. But what we've got to do is try and ensure that companies don't then try and take it all for themselves and keep it for themselves. Um, an free software is an increasingly significant player in computing infrastructure. Uh, so servers, basically, uh, telecommunications, that sort of thing, we're a pretty big player there. We're still a very small player in the desktop market, but it is growing, growing slowly. That's the one that has the highest visibility um, so growth in that sector is the one that people most obviously see, but the other sectors are incredibly important, and those other sectors where we are, already have a, play a very, very significant role, those sectors do have an enormous impact on society and to the net cost of information technology in society. Okay, so future of FOSS. Um, the... Uh, so the, basically the question I was, I was trying to raise at the bottom there, I've sort of already talked a bit about that stuff, is, uh, is it, the question isn't whether free software will be a success, it is how to ensure that Australian society can maximally benefit from the changes that free software can bring. So how can we benefit from free software? How do we gain the maximum benefit? We have to eliminate structural impediments to the use of free software. Now, there are enormous numbers of structural impediments to free software and the free software community is in a constant state of uh, war is perhaps overstating it but it, it's, it's close in trying to overcome these structural impediments and I'm talking about things like the DMCA I'm talking about things like patent law I'm talking about trade secrets I'm talking about the chilling effect of, of lawsuits um, these types of structural impediments are what threaten the ability of Australian society and global society from taking the best use of this resource, free and open source software. And so what we need to do is identify changes in public policy to ensure that we do, we, we remove these um, structural impediments or minimise their impact wherever possible. And it's damn difficult. It's really, really hard because the way the international um, uh, regulates where the international relationships, the relationships between countries and the international law works, it tends to impede the uh, creation of regulatory systems which um, are friendly towards openness. And so that's where the real challenge lies. We need to reduce the ability of companies to use anti-competitive means against free software. Right? Now some of that is happening. We've seen the, the great success in recent years after a number of failings in earlier years of antitrust law in Europe making a big difference. I was delighted to be involved somewhat in the EU case with Microsoft and the result of them uh, eventually announcing the release of an enormous number of protocol specifications. So Microsoft went from being the most closed company I could name on protocol specifications to being possibly the most open overnight. Now that change stemmed from antitrust law, that change stemmed from public policy and the staunch support of that policy by the um, Nellie Crows and the 
uh, EU Commissioner um, for Competition. And that was an incredible piece of work. It took nine years. It was betting the entire antitrust organisation in the EU on this. It was such a big case. But they won. It was an enormous win for society. And I think it will have an enormous ongoing impact on the future development of the IT industry. But we need more of that type of thing. Um, we, need to, um, we need to be very, very careful of a negative one. We're seeing something like the free trade agreement that Australia entered into, which uh, basically incorporated um, the, the notions of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act from the United States. Incredibly dangerous ideas, um, ideas based on a, a false premise, um, ideas based on um, restricting... Uh, uh, basically, it, it was based around the idea of increasing the number of structural impediments to the sharing of information and the um, sharing of um, our resources, our IT resources among the industry. It was trying to give companies more control, individual companies, more ability to control the industry. And I think that was very, very damaging. We need to work out how to try to uh, reduce the impact of that over time. Okay, maximise the portability of information between vendors. This is the document formats. And uh, we need to have a very strong statement. I think the simplest thing is that governments should lead by example. And I think the, um, all governments worldwide have not yet done nearly enough to lead by example on document formats, requiring uh, public information to be made available in public formats, requiring, for example, the, when the tax office makes available their web-based systems for doing your tax, that it, 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 it is not portable when it runs on IE5 and IE4 and IE6, it is portable when it uses web standards and it works on all the different web browsers out there. And in particular, if some new person came along and wrote a new web browser, they would be able to, they would be confident that their new web browser by following a standard would work with the tax officer's software. And that needs to be a direction coming from above because there is very little incentive for individual government departments to make that choice. So it has to be pushed from above in the government in order to push the departments to do the right long-term thing, because the right long-term thing will be an increased cost in the short term. It is more expensive to write server-side software that follows standards, but it is even more expensive to society to not do so. So we need incentives, we need encouragements from, the, from government to push for the departments to make the right choice for the longer-term benefit of Australian society, rather than making the short-term uh, choices which benefit their bottom line in this quarter. And that's a very, very difficult thing to do. So I'm, now I'm running a little bit low on time. What needs to be done? The, the government role, I think, is key. Um, governments, as I've said before, must strive to maximise the benefit to society of the increasing use of free software in the IT industry. Um, proprietary companies are likely to become increasingly desperate in their attempts to hold back the tides of change. Um, I think this is an interesting thing to ponder. Um, you have seen some fairly desperate moves in the IT industry over the past few years as um, uh, openness has uh, been steadily increasing. Uh, the moves by the Motion Picture Association, um, the RIAA uh, and other organisations um, have been... They really... Uh, w w when a company like that <laughs> is suing a grandmother, they are really scraping the bottom of the barrel in terms of desperation. And I expect we will see more desperate tactics of this nature over time as their market erodes. Um, free software is good for society. It is not necessarily good for the IT industry. It may be, uh, produce a net reduction in the total revenue to IT companies across the board. It will produce an increase in revenue for individual companies who embrace free software, but it could very well produce a net decrease. The motivations is not to make the IT industry richer, the, motor, the motivation has to be to make Australian society and world society richer. And we have to understand that there will be losers. Companies may not make the amazing profits, the you know, thousand percent profits and you know, the, the enormous profit margins that we sometimes see in the IT industry in an open computing world. And that is not necessarily a bad thing. Those profits are being paid for. When somebody said uh, earlier that Microsoft had in, in um, uh, invested a whole lot of money in the IT industry, where do you think that money came from? It came from the society. It bled it out of the society and Microsoft ended up keeping a lot more of the money than what they fed back. 
So the, uh, it is a net loss. Now, if, Microsoft, if, it's, if, if Microsoft's bank balance was lower, then that would mean there was more money in the rest of society. Uh, very, very simplistic economics, I know, but there is there's some basis to that. Um, so Australian governments should lead by example, um, following best practices and interfacing with society. If our government can't do it, when the government, um, uh, if the government can't do it, then it's very, very hard to, rec to expect uh, individual companies to perhaps have uh, uh, more of a, more skin in the game, as you might say, uh, to do it. Using open document formats and software that can be used on all platforms across government, this needs to be something that is strongly encouraged um, to the point there may need to be financial penalties for not doing it. There may need to be um, mechanisms for uh, enforcement mechanisms to ensure that uh, the government departments do do the right thing for the long-term benefit of society. Uh, and the Australian governments should ensure that taxpayer-funded software development should result in open software. And I think that is just such an obvious thing to happen. Uh, it's a crying shame when the government funds through research grants or whatever the development of um, a piece of software and it spins off some private company and that private company might be a great success, but um, that great success is dwarfed by the potential success of hundreds of smaller companies that might take advantage of that software or the end, end consumers, companies taking advantage of that software. And uh, I think that's a great shame and I think it should be strongly discouraged. So that's sort of it. That's basically the ideas that I, I had for... Oh, I did have one more slide. My apologies. I obviously created this slide set far too late last night. I've forgotten what was in it. Um, immediate concerns. Um, the immediate patent reform. This is one that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I think we desperately need patent reform. In particular, we need to find a way of solving the, the problem of independent invention. Independent invention should not be considered uh, a bad thing to do. Using your brain to solve a problem is a good thing. It is not a bad thing. It should not be punished. It should be particularly not punished when you can provably show that you had not, no access to that patent. I have been in situations where work I have done, I have subsequently found out that a patent was applied for um, you know, a couple of years before. The patent wasn't published well after I published my code, and yet I somehow owe them something. Hang on. I, I could prove that I did that work independently, and yet I owe them for my, for my own thoughts. I don't think it is reasonable. This also bears on um, another aspect of patent stuff. I'm not a strong supporter of uh, building up patent portfolios in the free software community, and I know I go against the trend here. Um, the reason for that is I think that if, let's pick someone at random, Bill Gates uh, thinks of an idea that I've thought of previously, I don't think I have any moral or ethical right to demand that Bill Gates not use his idea if he came up with it independently. So it works both ways. I don't think that tying patents to openness is the right thing. I think people should have the choice of being closed if they want to, but we shouldn't have impediments to being open. And um, so I don't think that's why I have no patents, and that's why um, in a recent article I said that you know chisels on my tombstone will be um, dyed with no patents and proud of it. Because I think patents as they currently stand are a, a, a blight upon the world. Uh, copyright reform. We need copyright reform. Years of poor copyright re legislation have left us with an absolutely huge mess. It needs a serious clean-up effort. And this will be a massive, um, massive task to be undertaken by numerous lawyers and bureaucrats. Um, and, uh, but it needs to be done, because it's an absolute mess at the moment. Use of FOSS in schools. This is something that I'm quite passionate about that uh, Pia mentioned earlier. And I can talk separately about that if anyone wants to, wants to come up to me afterwards. I know I'm running out of time and open document formats, as I think I've mentioned at least three times already, uh, governments need to wholeheartedly embrace open document formats and open interfaces. So I really am out of slides now. Any questions? It changes over time. People come up with new models all the time. The usual thing that when people ask me, um, how, can, how can you make money at, with free software, right? Um, the answer I usually give is it's the wrong question. It's how can you compete with free software? It is, if, imagine if person A goes into a business based around free software, person B goes into the business based around proprietary software, who's going to win? Right? The pricing model of A and the support he can get from the industry and the fact that he can build upon other things, right, eventually he will win. 
right? So that person B can be strangled out by person A. That's not a bad thing. Person B, if when, when somebody said earlier that companies need to be able to feed themselves, they need to be able to choose proprietary to feed their kids, it's perfectly true. And I would defend their rights to be proprietary. I think it is perfectly within the rights for people to choose to be proprietary, as long as, in doing so, they don't impede somebody else who has found a way to feed their kids while producing the same product in an open fashion, as long as the, the company that decides to go proprietary hasn't, ca cannot force the one that decides to go open out of business through some structural means like the you know, DRM or through patents or whatever. And so what we've got to ensure is that when people find openings and find ways of making money out of free software, they shouldn't be shut down by, by the, the party poopers. Right? So when Red Hat, it, it's discovered a way of doing it for its own niche. And in each niche, in each part of the industry, people will discover different ways. There are companies making billions of dollars in services revenue out of open source or selling the hardware or whatever. You know, there's, there's plenty of companies around doing this. There is billions of dollars being made right now out of free and open source software. Is there one method that works across the entire industry? No. There's lots of different methods. But we should ensure that when somebody comes up with a method that there isn't some artificial constraint that makes them fail when, uh, because otherwise we are, we are doing a disservice to society by um, preventing the gains that we would otherwise be able to get. I, I want to ensure that we don't have things that... I, I don't want to mandate open and uh, free software, except in things like government. I do want to mandate open document formats. I do want to mandate the release of uh, government-sponsored uh, software development as uh, free software. I think that is something that's worth doing, um, with all the usual caveats on security and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, I don't want to mandate uh, individual business models of uh, business models of individual companies, but I want to ensure that the legislative framework in Australian society is not such that it discourages or impedes companies who do want to go down that path and have found a way to do it, right, have found a mechanism that they can feed their families and release stuff in an open fashion. We, we, we shouldn't kill that golden goose. We should give them every opportunity. So you're talking sediment, it's really just to tackle... It's to tackle the DMCA, FTA type stuff, the patents, um, to tackle the... That's right. I think we need to remove those impediments and uh, that I think long term uh, free and open source so software will naturally grow as long as the impediments aren't there to hold it back. In some cases, but proprietary software might have a choice, for example, of licensing a patent. Uh, free software doesn't. So the impediment tends to get amplified in the case of free software. Whereas, yes, it is present in the case of proprietary software, but it tends to be the, the amplification can be enough to kill free software, plus because it is harder to find business models that work in the free software community, the margins are often small, <coughs> and that means they're more easily killed. Yeah. Uh, do you find yourself in a position of uh, advising governments? Do you come on panels to do that? No, very rarely. I, you know, I've talked to Kate a bit, and I've talked to occasionally when I get the opportunity to talk to people, but very rarely. Mostly I just try and code, because uh, I like programming. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was actually leading up to a question, and you might be able to answer this when you're through. Um, you know, being in the industry, I've, I'm exposed to technical experts quite a bit, like yourself. And uh, oftentimes I see government policy going totally against what experts are talking about. And my question is, who does the government get these ideas from? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mean I, I, I tried writing to them. <laughs> well, no, I'm serious. Like, if you look at things like Frontex programming that comes out every five or six years, you, know, I, you hear all experts saying this won't work. It's going to waste money. As someone who runs a non-profit, I see them spend $21 million on commercials for something that I know won't work. Right, 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 right. I mean, I, 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 are they listening to? I, I've... Um I think we have a historic opportunity to, to get the government to listen right now. I mean, I, I wrote letters to the previous government on numerous occasions on things like the FTA and, and other, you know, other issues, and I got the usual responses of, oh, yes, it's fine, we're, we're looking into it. You know, it was just rubbish. Um, and um, soon after a new Labor government was, was elected, I wrote my first letter, and it was to Kate, and she responded incredibly po positively. Um, I think we are at a real crossroads. We have the opportunity for experts in the industry to have a real influence on this government, and I think this 2020 summit is brilliant for that. So um, this is our opportunity.
That's right. That's right. Oh yes, for good reason. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. Right, and, and I think that many people have uh, tried to then tell that sector, um, oh, it'll be all right, you'll be okay, you'll just be able to do this or that. Well, no, it is going to hurt. It's better for society as a whole, but you know, it's been a, a real gravy train. Um, in the information technology, they've been um, ripping off society um, and not gaining the benefits that I think that uh, society could gain. And it, it is going to hurt many companies. The companies that can't adapt are going to die. And uh, some companies have adapted and they, they can do brilliantly and I hope we'll see more of those. But um, I, I think we've put too much said that, oh, it's all going to be all right, all these companies are going to be okay. Well, no, not all of them are going to be okay. Um, you know, when, when we switch from horses to cars, you know, all the horse, the people who put the horseshoes on or whatever made the horseshoes, well, yeah, they, they lost. Um, and uh, you do get losers as well as winners. Um, Jack, yeah, um, thank you, Patrick, from the Department of Environment, Water, Water, Trees and the Arts. Um, <laughs> well, let's, name, um, <laughs> let's try to spell it out. <laughs> um, we, I, I think there's a couple of kind of points about of how it relates to government. And one that it's not like governments currently, anyway, is one. Entity making these decisions, purchasing and right. planning decisions, and everything right. like that. And when they are, yes. it doesn't mean that the departments are following them. And That's really, right. it's either a management buy in issue or a resource yes. issue. Yes. If you look at, at just the, um, the hearing up requirements for accessibility and usability websites, most departments aren't meeting all those requirements. Right. And that's because either they don't put enough priority on it, right. or there's no one enforcing it. Because right. if you have a security issue on your site, BSD will come up down on you like a ton of bricks. Mm. If you, unless someone actually goes there for suing you mm. uh, about your website, which that's right. Once, that's right. Yeah, no, it, it they won't. don't care because there's no, there's yeah, no, there's no pressure. Going wrong. There isn't the yeah. pressure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and the obvious solution to that as a computer scientist is random sampling. You know, you, you need to have some group that um, goes and randomly, like random breath tests, you know, goes and randomly tests this stuff and then has a hefty enough fine multiplied by the probability of getting caught that it acts as, as a deterrent. And that's the same basis as random breath testing. And, we, you know, that same basis can be a cost-effective way of ensuring that these sort of standards are adhered to. Um, it also needs to, absolutely, from, what, from where I see, uh, at, the, at the bottom of a long chain of command, there also needs to be some amount of a carrot. Yeah. With, oh, yeah. You know, providing either additional resources or support or infrastructure or something yeah. to make it easier for these departments to do that. To right. do, this, do this work, this, you know, this yeah. open standard, this accessibility, user, all those kind of things. Yeah, and, and your point about uh, government being big is not one individual. Um, that's extremely true. It's also true of companies. When people talk about Microsoft, I mean, a lot of my, some, there are sections of Microsoft doing some fantastic work. Uh, it's a big company. Uh, the same with every big company. There's a lot of views. There is not one view. There tends to be a, a few spokesmen at the top who, who give their views, and you, you can be sure that there's you know, thousands of people in their organizations that are cringing when listening to the views of Obama or whoever. Right? Um, that's just the nature of it. And uh, getting in touch with those individuals um, who are interested in collaborating can be difficult, but it's very rewarding, as I've found. Um, at the Samber XP conference uh, later this month in Germany, um, where we're going to have um, several Microsoft engineers turning up. And um, if you think about that in terms of the history of the Samba project and where things we've, we've got a now good enough relationship with those engineers, and they are darn good engineers, that we can have a useful dialogue with them. And that's, a, that's an incredible outcome, I think. Um, and so you do need to identify the right individuals in government, in companies that are open to discussion and, and foster that. <laughs> Come on, Rusty. So, one of your points about um, enforced compliance and the difficulty of, of compliance, I mean, that does also engender a minor small industry uh, for all those people who, you know, now they've got this actual competition with the software industry, you know, to keep finding jobs, they can be the ones who are helping out, you know, making. They, they, uh, they can be the web police. <laughs>
Okay. Yep. I agree. Okay. Thank you. seems that um, while there may be many business models, it is really a matter of shifting to the services to support the software and hardware in this IT ecosystem, um, rather than to, in, in fact, it may be more economically efficient. Um, whatever combination of people um, operating in sort of a non-market uh, environment, and people are actually getting paid on the clock to develop open source. Right. I, I, I try to shy away from just taking support as being the, the panacea solution to how do you make money out of free software, just because um, in the long term, if the software becomes really, really good, you shouldn't need the support. I actually um, didn't support in that way. I meant services. Okay. Like you think about professional But even, even professional services stuff, it yeah. should be less needed the better the software gets. Now that hasn't, isn't happening yet, but maybe by 2020 that will start to see some of that. Yeah. Um, and so then people will find other mechanisms and I have no doubt that pe people are very inventive on ways of making money yeah. and I would never have dreamed of the sort of mechanisms that you know various free software companies have, have done uh, I'm just not you know that economically inclined and you know can't think of such things yeah. but just let them get on with it and, and find ways there are entrepreneurs will find opportunities in uh, an amazing range of, of industries um, so anyway that's that's I said I don't think uh, thank you very yeah. much Okay, thank you.